turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm going to read in the second part of verse 5 through verse 11. If you have a pew Bible, that's on page 1016. Hear the word of the Lord. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, again, we ask for your help as we hear from your word, this eternal word, these eternal truths that are based upon your character, that are based upon that great plan of old, uh, based upon that covenant love, that loving kindness that you have given to us and have promised that you will continue to give to us until the end of time. Oh Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand these truths, help us to believe them, and help us to walk accordingly. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. James Tillis is a retired heavyweight boxer, uh, hailing originally from Oklahoma, He was sometimes known as the cowboy, sometimes known as the quick. He was one of the first men who went the distance with Mike Tyson. Overall, a very successful career, but not exactly the career that he had wanted. He, in his biography, began to tell of the moment he moved up to the big leagues and he found himself on a bus going to the city of Chicago. He had his luggage in hand. As soon as he got off the bus, he immediately found himself in front of the Sears Tower, the the tallest building in Chicago, I think the second now in the United States. And in awe, he put his bags down on the ground and just stared up at this edifice, this, this great monument to man's ability. And he said in a very loud voice to where others could hear him, I am the conqueror of Chicago. And for a moment he meditated upon that great truth until he decided to go on his way. He looked down and his bags were gone. (laughs) Already some stranger had bested the conqueror of Chicago. Now isn't that how life is sometimes? Uh, We all have these great expectations for what our life will be like, of how we will have this great love, this great work, and all this glory that will go along with it, even from childhood. We already begin having these dreams of, of, of aspirations, of how great it will be. And then life steps in, and we're humbled by our circumstances. Sometimes we're humbled in love. The girl that we liked doesn't like us. The guy that we had a crush on doesn't return the same love. Sometimes it's in work. Sometimes we're passed over for a promotion, or or sometimes we've been laid off or we're fired and we're humiliated in that sense. Sometimes it's in our friendship. The person that we trusted the most betrays us and and speaks behind our back. Sometimes it's in our parenting. Uh, That bundle of joy that we loved so much we thought was going to make us proud instead humbled us in many different ways. Sometimes it's in our old age, just in our expectations for our health and all that we'll do in our retirement and then cancer steps in, or some other uh, weakness steps in that hinders us from living the life that we had dreamed of. And then sometimes it's just from plain old suffering. 
and the misery that goes along with that. The letter that Peter is writing to the believers in Asia Minor at this time is writing to a group of men and women and even children who are going through a time of suffering. We don't know exactly what it was that they're experiencing, but we know that it was not what they had hoped it would be. We know that they had their own expectations of what Christianity would be like. And it didn't quite measure up to what they were experiencing. And so Peter is writing for two purposes. First of all, to encourage them about the true grace of God that is at work in the midst of their humiliation, in the midst of their suffering, to encourage them. And then the second reason for writing them is to assure them of God's desire to, in fact, exalt them, to raise them up. You realize it's God's plan before the foundations of the world that every believer in Christ Jesus would be glorified. Every believer in Christ Jesus would be lifted high to be exalted. He says his desire, his promise for you is that you would shine as bright as the sun in all of its glory. That's his plan for you. From the very beginning, before you were ever born, that was his desire for your life that you would be glorified. But there are some stipulations to that. The first stipulation is this. Our glory is never to be obtained in isolation. It's only to be obtained in our union with Christ Jesus. It's only as we share in Christ's glory that we ourselves will be glorified. That's stipulation number one. Stipulation number two, in addition to sharing in our union with Christ, God also orchestrates our humiliation on purpose because this is his path to glory. He purposely humbles us to test our faith to see whose dream we still believe in, to see whose kingdom we're still trying to build up. And so God's path to glory purposely humbles us that we might turn toward Christ again and share in his glory rather than trying to obtain our own, to achieve our own in some way. You see, God's way is not our way. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And his path to glory is not the path that you had in mind since the day you were a younger a child. From the very beginning, God's path to glory has consisted of humility and it will con continue to consist of humility all the days of your life. And so here are my main two points for this morning. First of all, it's God's plan that we humble ourselves before men. Secondly, it's God's plan that we humble ourselves before God. So let's talk about that first one. A humility, a calling to humility before men. As most of you know, humility is simply a lowliness of mind. It's seeing ourselves in the proper perspective. It's esteeming others better than ourselves, more significant than ourselves. Martin Luther once gave an illustration of two mountain goats on a very narrow ledge on a very tall mountain. And he had observed this himself, realized the path is only wide enough for one goat to pass through. But the problem is the two goats had just met each other. You can't go backwards because it would be too dangerous. The path is not wide enough to turn around. And he said, if they were like us, like humans, they would just butt each other in the head and then they both fall off the cliff. Instead, what do they do? One of them lies down on the ground and allows the other one to walk over him in order that they both might cross. That is the path to glory that Christ has displayed for us that we're to follow. If you remember, Christ said he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, literally laying down his life for his brothers. And he calls us to do the same. In verse 5, Peter says, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Figuratively, he's saying, Put on the apron of the slave or serpent. Tie the strings around your waist and take on that mindset of the servant because literally that's what Christ did. Even on the night when his disciples are arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, arguing about who's going to sit in the seat of honor, arguing about who's going to wash the, the feet of the dirty disciples, Jesus literally ties the strings of the slave's apron around his waist and shows them the path 
to glory. Through humiliation. Through humility. And Peter witnesses this. He sees this in action and he's overwhelmed by it. Again, it's not the way that we would do it. It's not our mindset. It's the mindset of Christ. But why? Why does it have to be this way? Because of who God is. God opposes the proud, the scripture says. But he gives grace to the humble. God wants to share his glory with us. And the way he is glorified is by taking weak and foolish men and women and children and raising them up. He can't do that with a proud man. A proud man refuses to listen. A proud man refuses to bow. A proud man refuses to go God's way. He has to go his own. And so the second main point today is not only that we have to have humility before men, but even more importantly, we have to have humility before God. Verse 6, look there. Peter says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. You must understand that no man on this earth can humble you unless it's God's will that you be humbled. Think of it this way. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, had plotted and plotted to kill Christ. And they were successful. But why? Because it was God's will to crush his son. In the same way, Joseph's brothers had plotted to get rid of him and they had stripped him of his coat of many colors. And they had thrown him into a pit and they sold him into the slavery and they were successful. Why is that? Because it was God's will to humble Joseph. It was God's will that he would become a slave. It was God's will that he would become a prisoner. It was God's will that ultimately he would be raised up in Egypt as the second in command. You see, all along it's God's plan. He orchestrates every instance of our humiliation. And he does it all for our good. He does it all for our glory, to share in his glory. There's not a single moment in your life in which you've been humbled that it wasn't God's will for you to be humbled. And the most important thing here is you need to know the difference that sometimes the word humility and the word humiliation are used synonymously, and sometimes they're not. Sometimes we can be humiliated and yet not be humbled. In that sense, what I mean is, sometimes we can be lowered in esteem in other people's eyes. We can be ashamed by other men, but yet not ashamed of ourselves. Not less esteemed in our own eyes, in our own estimation. This command that, Paul, that Peter gives us here in this text, though, is that we would humble ourselves, not be humbled by others, or not be just humbled by God. But it's an active command to lower the esteem of ourselves in our own eyes under God's mighty hand. You see, the problem is we have a tendency to fight God even in the midst of this path to glory. But if you fight him, you're not going to grow. God's plan is that you would know your place and trust that he knows what he's doing and that he does it better than you do. If you don't, you're not going to grow. If it's his will to humble you, you have to believe that there's more in store for you. There's a greater plan in store for you. So why, though? Why should we humble ourselves? The scripture says, so that at the proper time, God might exalt you. So the question naturally arises, I think, at this point, so when is that proper time? The simple answer is whenever God deems best, if you can accept it. Because one of the greatest aspects of humility is waiting upon God's timing. Waiting upon God's timing in our humbling and waiting upon God's timing in our exalting. But sometimes that exaltation can take place in the near future. It can take place within our lifetime. And yet sometimes it doesn't take place until the day of judgment. Until the day in which all things are made right. But humility is waiting upon God's timing. Now, Another question that goes along with that is, what will that exaltation look like? Again, a simple answer would be, whatever God deems best. Again, it's not our way. We have these ideas in our head of what we should be exalted in, but we just sang in one of these hymns that God deigns to exalt a sinner at all should baffle us, and yet we still expect more. We still expect to have it our way. 
rather than God's way. It's whatever God deems best. Now, sometimes that exaltation could simply be a matter of greater spiritual blessings in your life. And you're being drawn closer in fellowship to Christ. Now, what if I were to tell you that that was the only exaltation you received? Would you be content with that? Or do you have to have more? I tell you that that spiritual blessing, that greater fellowship with Christ, is greater than any other blessing you would ever receive in this life. Do you remember what the psalmist says in Psalm 73? He says, Who have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The greatest exaltation that you can ever receive in this life or in the life to come is to have that greater spiritual blessing of being drawn closer in fellowship to Christ. Do you want to be exalted? That should be the greatest aspiration that you have. Any other aspiration is missing the mark because it cannot measure up. It can't measure up to what Christ can give you. But then sometimes that exaltation can also mean in this life or in the life to come a greater responsibility, a greater reward, a greater, uh, a greater hope in that sense. And again, that can be this time or it can be at a later time. But humility is waiting on God's timing and waiting upon his exaltation. Whatever it looks like, the most important thing to remember is this. When God exalts you, it will be very clear that it's his mighty hand that has raised you up in the same way that his mighty hand had pressed you down. Uh, perhaps some of you have seen a poster once of a turtle on a fence post. You see a, a tall white picket fence and there's a turtle sitting on top of the fence post. Do you think he got there by himself? Very obvious he had help. When God exalts you, that's how it will be. There'll be no doubt in your mind or anyone else's that it wasn't your doing. You didn't raise yourself up by your bootstraps. God raised you up in glory because he was the one who pressed you down in humiliation for your good and to share in his glory. So we know what his plan is. We know his plan for exaltation. We know his plan in our humiliation. But what do we do in the midst of our humiliation? What do we do now when we're struggling, when we're suffering? How do we respond to that? There are two ways that Peter mentions here. First of all is to pray. Secondly, to watch. And it's interesting, the first one with prayer, some of the translations in verse 7 uh, Translated as if it's a new sentence altogether, that it's another command that's not related to the previous one, saying, okay, well, you should also cast your anxiety upon the Lord as if it's another command. That's not how it is. In the Greek, it's a participial phrase that modifies the command to humble yourselves. So it should read something like, humble yourselves, casting all your anxieties upon him before he cares for you. You see, only the humble wait upon the Lord. That's true. But only the humble call out upon the Lord in the midst of their humiliation. The proud man is unable to do so because of his pride. The proud man will not cry out to God because he despises God's sovereignty and he despises God's providence. And it's true. And you know all of us have struggled with that. In our pride, we want it our way. We don't want it God's way. And so when God sends us the path of humiliation, we're tempted to have a prayerless life. We're tempted to figure it out on our own. You realize our, our prayer life says quite a bit about how much we trust God, especially in times of humiliation. If we pray less when we're humbled, it shows how proud we really are. You see, a proud man is an anxious man. Let me repeat that. A proud man is an anxious man. Humble men are anxious because they know that they're not smart enough to figure it out on their own. They know they're not strong enough to exalt themselves. They have to cry out unto God. Only a proud man is an anxious man because he's constantly trying to carry the burden on his own shoulders and he can't do it. And so it makes him anxious. A humble man sees his weakness, he sees his ignorance, and he cries out to God. A humble man also believes in the midst of his humiliation, that God cares for him. 
you know, early on, if you remember the disciples, as they're struggling in the Sea of Galilee and the turbulent waters, and Jesus is asleep, they, they cry out to him and they say, don't you care that we're perishing? A proud man constantly struggles with that. Don't you care that I'm experiencing all this? Don't you care that I'm suffering? Don't you care that I'm being humiliated? But then later on we see Peter, he's not praying, he's not watching, he's sleeping in the midst of his pride. After boasting that he would not deny Christ, even if all the other disciples had denied him, he then denies him three times. But the minute that he understands God's care for him is when the rooster crows and Jesus in the midst of his own humiliation looks over at Peter in love. In the midst of his anxiety, in the midst of his pride, Jesus shows him, I love you. And that's why he's writing this text down. Peter sees it in Jesus' eyes. Jesus loves me in the midst of my greatest anxiety, in the midst of my greatest humiliation. Jesus loves me. Why would you not cast your cares upon a God who cares for you in that way? He loves you. This is a good plan for you. It's not evil. He's a good God. Therefore, cast your cares upon him. But in addition to that, in addition to prayer in the midst of humility, notice secondly, he also commands us to watch. A proud man doesn't realize his vulnerabilities. You know, it's interesting, almost every stronghold or every castle in medieval times that ever fell to an opposing army, it almost always fell, not at the point of its weakness, but at the point of its strength. Because you see, the defenders of the wall always knew the weakest point, and they would double up their army in the weak part of the wall. But every conquering army knows that that's what they're going to do, and so they purposely send their army toward the area of strength where they're not defending it. They'll climb that unscalable wall. They'll go to that unconquerable part of the wall, and that's where they attack. And because they were proud about that strong part of the wall, they weren't defending it. You see, that's the way Satan works. Satan doesn't attack us in the obvious ways that we like to think most of the time. Satan attacks us at our greatest vulnerability. And he knows it because he had the same vulnerability himself. If you remember, the reason why the devil fell from heaven was because of his pride, because of his area of strength. And when he attacks us, he doesn't come at us at our weakness most of the time, but rather he comes at us at our strength. He attacks our pride. He appeals to our pride. And he says things to us like, you deserve better than this. He says things to us like, you know, obviously God doesn't care for you, otherwise he wouldn't allow this to happen to you. Why would a good God allow such evil to happen to you? He appeals to our pride. And then if we're not walking in humility, we'll fall into it. If we're not watching, if we don't know that that's what our pride leads to, we'll fall into it. We see over and over again, that's how Jesus had to battle the devil. But see, it begins with pride, but here's what's the interesting thing about it. Then he attacks your weaknesses after he's broken down the strength. Once your pride falls, you give in to that temptation, then bitterness enters, then fearfulness enters, then anxiety enters, then depression enters. Every other slew of sin that could possibly accompany that pride falls because the strength has fallen first. God attacks the pride, excuse me, devil attacks the pride, and then everything else falls. You know, and, and sometimes he doesn't always do that directly. Sometimes he does that through other men, uh, through our enemies, surely, but also even through our family and friends. It, it's interesting when Jesus tells Peter, he says, get behind me, Satan. One of Jesus' closest friends on earth, the devil was using to tempt him because he was saying, no, you don't have to follow that path of humiliation why don't you take the direct path to glory? And Jesus immediately senses, no, what you're saying is not true. That's of the devil. In the same way, if you remember, Job in the midst of his trials, seeking to be faithful in the midst of all of these different things that are happening in his life, then all of a sudden his wife says to him, after the boils are all over his body, his wife says, just curse God and die. But do you realize it's the devil speaking through her? 
Because from the very beginning of Job, we read twice that his intention is to have Job curse God to his face. Just do this and Job will curse you to your face. And now you see his wife is saying, just curse God to his face. His very own wife was tempting him toward his pride. Again, a humble man realizes his weaknesses. He knows, especially in the time of his humiliation, that he's tempted to fall to pride. And so he watches. He's sober. He knows his God who cares for him, but he also knows the devil who desires to devour him. And so he prepares for it. Then lastly, let's talk about the promise of God. If you look forward to verse 10. Peter says, after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. It's interesting, those choice of words that are used there. The first word is that restoration normally is used in the sense of mending nets. In the same way, after our humiliation, God mends our hearts. He heals our hearts. He makes us whole. He makes us right. He restores that which was lost. And secondly, that word confirmation. He confirms our faith. He confirms our calling. Literally in the Greek it means he stands us back up on our own two feet. We have been pressed down by God. He then picks us up and stands us on our feet. He confirms us as the children of God. But then the last two, it's interesting. Strengthen and establish are, are words that are used in architectural building up of a building. And it's the same two words that Peter used earlier on to refer to the body of Christ, how the whole building is being built up together with Christ Jesus as the, the foundational stone. What he's saying here is he's going back to when, if you remember when Jesus confronts Peter on the shore of Galilee after he's fallen into sin, after he's denied Christ three times. And now he comes to him, he restores him, he confirms him, but then he strengthens and establishes him, not individually, you see. Because even our glory, as I said, was not in isolation. It's not only a glory with Christ, but it's also a glory to be shared with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a glory to be shared with the church. So when God humbles you, it's not just for your glory. It's for the glory of the whole church to build up the whole body of Christ. When God exalts you after humbling you, it's not just for your purpose. It's that all might see and know that God is faithful to his promises. You have to know that Jesus had moments of glory on this earth, but they were just far and few between. At his birth, if you remember the angels, I mean, a whole choir of angels was singing praises at his birth. How many of you had angels singing at your birth? Right? And then at a later time, we see that Jesus is transfigured in his glory before three of the disciples. They literally see him in the brightness of his glory. And then for a brief moment, the week before his passion, we see him riding triumphantly through the city of Jerusalem. People are throwing down cloaks in the path so that he could walk over them. And again, they're singing his praises. Those were moments of glory. But you have to know that his lot as a whole in this life was one of humiliation, not one of glory. And it's the same way for us. If we're living our lives now for the sake of having glory in this life, we're living for the wrong reason. You see, Christ's path to glory is a life of humiliation now and glory later. I mean, think about it. Christ, his own family, uh, they, they thought he was out of his mind. His brothers mocked him. I mean, the, the teachers of the law accused him of being in league with the devil. Random people were accusing him of being a drunkard and, and a, a glutton. We see that his own disciples all abandoned him. His people rejected him. Judas betrays him. And then we see the people demanding that he be crucified as a criminal. He was despised and rejected by men in every possible way. How can we possibly think 
that if God loves his own son, that he has somehow given us a humiliation that's too great for us. How can we possibly think that? The way of the master is the way of the servant. That's why the Apostle Paul, later on in Philippians 3, is saying, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection, and I want to share in the fellowship of his sufferings so that somehow I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. You know, either Paul is completely crazy for wanting to share in the sufferings of Christ. Either he's a lunatic in every possible way, or he knows something that many of us don't. That the path to glory only comes through our suffering alongside of Christ Jesus. Of suffering in union with Christ Jesus. So part of the message this morning is just to remind us of that truth as believers that uh, we have to lay down the dreams that we had and take up God's plan from all eternity. And then for some of you who are, are new to Christianity and don't quite understand what I'm talking about, it seems awfully antagonistic to what you might want for your own life. I only pray that you have heard the beginning of something. The seed has been sown in your heart and it's made you a little uncomfortable. And that God would show you that there's joy to be had at the right hand of Christ, no matter where that path leads. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be saved. Let's pray. Our Father, once again, we're confronted with the way, the truth, and the life. Not just a way, not just a truth, but the life. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to see there is only one truth here. Help us to see it's yours. Lord, we pray that not only would we be humiliated, but that we would be humbled in the midst of our humiliation. Lord, help us to embrace the life that you have in store for us. Help us to believe the promises concerning our exaltation. Lord, help us to trust you in the midst of our humiliation. To God alone be the glory. May we share in it with him. Through Christ Jesus we pray.